we talked about? Sharing is sometimes risky, right? You don't know what people are going to think when you put something out there, whether it's online or in person or in small group or wherever. When you share something, sometimes there's a risk to that. You don't know what kind of feedback you're going to get, right? So, sometimes sharing your opinions on something feels risky. Uh, all of us are more comfortable with a certain degree of uh, risk than others. Uh, some of you do not want to risk anything, so you won't say a word, right? There's a balance in there somewhere. What things are worth the risk of sharing? Uh, and, and in this series, we've been talking about Samuel, who is God's prophet at the time in the Old Testament. And uh, what is a prophet again? Can somebody just shout it out? What's a prophet? Not all at once. What's a prophet? Someone that God has chosen to do what? Be a messenger. Right. So a prophet is like God's mouthpiece from God to his people. So God's prophets share the message of God to his people. Right. And so Samuel, he had, we talked a few weeks ago about how he grew up as a young boy uh, with the, under the priest, Eli. Um, he, he says, here I am, Lord, and, and uh, use me however you want. And, and Samuel goes out and he becomes God's mouthpiece to the people. He becomes a prophet. And then, and then last week, we talked about how the, the nation of Israel, they wanted nothing. They, they, they wanted uh, to be like the other nations. And so they wanted a king. Uh, and, and Samuel is like, don't do that. It's a bad idea. And, and kings are flawed. But God says, let them do what they want anyway. So he says, it's a bad idea, but God won't stop you. He gives us free choice. And, and so they anoint Saul as their king. And so Saul is, uh, is, is the king over Israel for a number of years. He's the first king. And it actually starts pretty well. Uh, and, and then it kind of goes downhill. You, you know when uh, you, uh, you think you're right about something, whether it's your, your parents tell you to do something, and you're like, why? And they give you the reason, and you're like, no, I don't approve of your reasoning. I know better, right? Or maybe they say, because I told you so. And that's all more reason for you to be like, no, because you're stubborn, right? This was me growing up. Or, or maybe, maybe uh, somebody at school or a teacher or a coach, they tell you to do something, and you're like, no, I know better, right? Or your friends tell you to do something, you're like, no. And, and maybe they're right, maybe your parents are right, maybe your coach is right, maybe your teacher is right, but you think you're right. And th this is called pride, where you think you know better than everybody, or you think of yourself better than you ought, right? The Bible says pride comes before the fall. And in Saul's case, this was true. Saul was, was commanded by God to rule a certain way, to do certain things. And Saul repeatedly said, no, I think I know better. And Saul would rule according to his own satisfaction and not to God's satisfaction. And so finally, this happens for the last time, and, and Samuel has to go say, like, hey, uh, sorry, Saul, you're out. God gave you a job to do as the king, and you disobeyed. You decided to do things your own way. And God's not cool with that. You're leading all of his people astray. So you're out. And, and this, kind of, this ends up in this big confrontation, and, uh, and it, it's terrible. And, and at the time, you know, Saul had been king for 25 years. So Samuel and Saul had worked hand in hand to be God's mouthpiece and God's governance to his people. And after 25 years, God has just finally had enough. And so this is what, what we read in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Um, it says this. So this is after their big, uh, their big confrontation where, where Samuel's like, we're done. God is displeased with you. You, you disobeyed for the last time. And they have this big breakup, essentially. And, uh, and you can put this on the screen if you want. But here's, here's the scripture right here, okay? This is 1 Samuel chapter 15. It says, Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So essentially, Samuel's heartbroken over the fact that Saul did not lead God's people correctly. And, and so he's mourning for Saul. He's mourning for what should have been, what could have been, but what wasn't. And then the Lord said to Samuel, 
How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. In other words, stop hiding out and refusing to be my mouthpiece anymore because you're mourning for Saul's disobedience. Just because Saul is out doesn't mean you are. Just because Saul disobeyed doesn't mean that I don't still have a job for you. Basically, get your horn, go out and keep being my mouthpiece. So he, uh, he says, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. In other words, if the current king finds out you're going to go and find a different king, then that becomes a threat to him. And Saul doesn't like this. So, uh, so it's, it's a risk. The Lord said, take a heifer, which is a cow, and, uh, and have a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So in other words, Saul has disobeyed. He's out. He's no longer got God's blessing to rule the people. So he sends Samuel to go and find another king uh, who's going to be one of the sons of Jesse in Bethlehem. And if any of you have heard the story, we, we talked about it several times up here over the years, where Samuel the prophet goes to anoint the next king of Israel. And Jesse has a bunch of sons, sons good-looking men, strong, handsome, and Samuel can't find the one that God wants. And then finally, Jesse's like, oh, well, I have another one that's out in the field. He's watching the sheep. He's my shepherd boy, right? So Jesse doesn't even consider him a real son. And then God's like, that's the one, right? And then this sets off the trajectory of King David, who will be one of the greatest kings that Israel ever has. And it all starts because of Saul's disobedience. It starts because Saul decided not to follow God. So, you know, God says, you have free will, you can do what you want, but I'm going to keep moving with my plan with or without you. He goes, without. And he, anoint, he sends Samuel to anoint David to be the next king, right? This is, this is a, a, again, incredibly risky for Samuel. One, Samuel was mourning the loss of what should have been. But then God asked him to go and anoint the next king, basically without Saul knowing, because if Saul catches wind, Saul would have Samuel killed, right? And, and so this is a risk for Samuel to go and do this. But it's something that God calls him to. And, and following through on this command uh, is something that each and every one of us are, are faced with. Whether or not we're going to do what God has called us to do, where we're going to assist the, uh, assess the risk, and we may or may not follow through. But how do you know when what God has called you to is worth the risk? And Samuel, he, he, he risks his life to do this. Um, and, uh, and he had an opportunity to not follow through on it, but he chose to follow through on it anyway, right? He's motivated by his connection and his relationship with God. And, and God's faithfulness inspired him over the years to give him the confidence to go out on, uh, on a limb again. And so uh, I want you guys to discuss this as a group for a second. I've got a couple questions. One, who do you mostly identify with in the story of Samuel this week, uh, Samuel or Saul, and why? And then what do you think about the risk Samuel took to appoint a new king? Uh, Addy, can you put that on the screen for me? And then you guys have a couple more minutes in your group to discuss, and we'll come back here in a minute. Samuel had to assess the risk, but this is a story that happens all throughout Scripture, is where people have to assess the risk of following God's calling on their lives and whether or not they're going to follow through on it. Paul had a very similar experience. Okay? Paul, if, who was Saul, if you remember, he persecuted Christians. He was responsible for the stoning of Samuel in the book of Acts, or of Stephen in the book of Acts. He was responsible for persecuting the church, and uh, he was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. He was Jewish. He had high esteem, and he was going after people who he thought were blasphemous, who who claimed that Jesus was God and spoke of the resurrection. And then suddenly, on the road to Damascus to go persecute more Christians, Jesus appears to him. And, and he becomes a Christian, he believes, he starts following Jesus, turns his whole life around. And this is what he says when he's writing his letter to the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. But if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. See, 
Just like God transformed uh, Paul's whole life, his outlook, his, his experience, Paul literally became saved and followed Jesus and, ha- and said, you know what? I will, I will stop at nothing to make sure everybody else knows this truth, that I was wrong and that they should know about Jesus. Right? And so he does this and, and he, he helps us to see that, that this word compel, uh, you can go back to the verse for just a second, this word compel in verse 14 so uh, he says, Christ's love compels us. It's like when, when I'm watching TV at night and an ad for the Taco Bell New Cantina Chicken Crunchy Taco comes on, and I feel compelled to get into my car and go through the drive through right then to get that food, okay? Uh, it's, it's like when you get home from school and you feel compelled to turn on those video games and start playing right away. It's like, it's like when you're, you, you are, are starving and you start to smell food. Maybe you get to the parking lot and you open the door and the the smell of the restaurant hits you and you feel compelled to go and eat right away, right? It's this compulsion. He says, Christ's love compels us. And in the face of risk, we, we can either do one of two things. We can act out of fear of what might happen due to the risk we're taking, or we can act out of something else that motivates us. And, and what Paul says is basically this. He, he helps us to see that God's love motivates us towards action. In other words, when we see risk, it's Christ's love that compels us into action rather than fear that makes us withdraw. And so he says we, we have to share the good news with other people. And sometimes it's risky, but it's worth the risk. Sometimes sharing the good news requires risk. And sometimes... You're going to feel like you're putting, some, you're putting yourself out there by, by, by stating what you believe, by withholding from what everybody else is doing, but by, by risking being the weird one who won't do what everybody else is doing. Sometimes it requires risk. Sometimes it requires even more of you than feeling weird. Sometimes it, it literally means I, I can't be a part of this travel team because it means it's going to take me away from my community, and, and that's not worth the risk. Some, sometimes... Faith requires risk, and sometimes sharing that faith requires the risk of being cut from the team, requires the risk of a, of a reputation that you want to have, requires more of you than you initially thought. But it's worth the risk every time. And it's not out of fear that we shrink back from that risk, but it's out of God's love that motivates us towards action. Sometimes sharing the good news requires risk. You know, it can be tempting for us to look at our, our situation, look at Paul, look at Samuel, and think, wow, they risked their lives. And actually, Paul, he knew the same sword he used towards other people was going to be turned back onto himself when he became a Christian. That, that suddenly he was open for persecution, and he did get persecuted. He, he knew that his reputation was at stake. He, he knew that he was going to be judged by other Christians who didn't yet know if he was sincere about his faith or if he was just pretending so that he could persecute them, right? Paul knew the tremendous risk. And in fact, he was persecuted, and he, he was killed for his faith under Emperor Nero. But it was worth the risk. And look, we can look back today and see all the difference that he made in the world. We have a Bible today in large part because of Paul and his work and his, the letters he wrote to the churches. Right? His encouragement. It's worth the risk. Right? But we can look at that and sometimes go, man, I, my life's not required of me. Today. I'm not going to fear to lose my life the way Paul did. What, what kind of risk am I taking for being a Christian? Right? You, you know the risks socially. You, you may not be asked physically to give up your life the same way that they were then. But what are the risks? Sometimes it can feel like that's overwhelming. Sometimes it may feel like, well, that's not applicable to me in my life. But those moments where you risk it all for your faith, those are so far and few in between. Very rarely are you going to be asked to risk everything for your faith or to share the good news with somebody else. But you know what does take up a lot of your day? All the little small things. When you're, when you're in the cafeteria at school, right, and you have the 20 minutes where you, you're in the same room of hundreds of people who may or may not have the same hope of Jesus, that you have an opportunity to influence in how you spend your time those 20 minutes. It may not seem like much, but the, that small thing, if you add it up, that's like 3 to 5% of your day, right? 
And three, the 5% of the time that you spend around other people at school, maybe more, 10% of, of the school day, you have the opportunity to make a huge difference because that 10% will have compound interest over time. The relationships and the investments you make in the people around you during that time will add up. And those small things can have a huge difference and an impact on the people around you during those times. It, it may not seem like much, but the small things like listening to your parents, doing your chores, uh, showing love and kindness to your siblings, those seem like small things, but percentage-wise, that takes up a huge portion of your life. And if you can do those small things well, it, it'll make a huge difference. Mother Teresa said it this way, do small things with great love. And that will have a much larger impact for most of us than the occasional big thing that we might have to risk everything for in order for our faith to be shown to others. Most of us, our faith is in the small things. And if we can be faithful with those small things, God can do a lot with those. So um, before you go to your groups, um, I'm going to skip a few slides here. I, I want you to, to, to take away with these four things. One, sharing doesn't rely on you. Okay? Um, we can feel like, oh, their, their life is in my hands if I don't share the good news. And Yeah, but just like Saul, God has plans, and he's going to move forward them, with them with or without you. But it's much more fun to be a part of it, right? It's not your job to convict somebody. That's the Spirit's job. It's your job to share, okay? So that's, that's the first thing. Sec secondly, sharing in itself is success, right? Uh, maybe, maybe you'll be the one to baptize them. Maybe not. Maybe you'll, they'll reject you. Who knows, right? But you're planting seeds. So sharing in and of itself is the su success regardless of the outcome. Maybe somebody will laugh at you for sharing today, but 10 years from now, they'll look at, and remember that interaction and be like, you know, I, I made fun of them and I, I, I ridiculed them for sharing with me, but you know what? That was a small part in my story and how I got saved, right? You don't know that. So sharing in itself is the success. Three, sharing isn't for experts only, right? It's not just for people like me or your small group leader to, to share the good news. Sharing is for everybody. You, you can do this in the way that you live your life, your actions, the way you treat people, your words, and sometimes actually sharing the gospel in and of itself. It's not just for the experts. You can learn to do this. And four, sharing is risky, but not bonkers, right? It carries some risk, but it's not going to be devastating to your life in most situations. You can learn to take the risk and share the good news that you have with others and find creative ways to do that, right? Um, so the question I want to ask you is, how is God's love motivating you to take risks, right? How's it motivating you to take the risks? Maybe, maybe it's a big thing. Maybe it's not. Probably it's not. Maybe it'll motivate you to, to talk to somebody new at the lunch table or somewhere else in school or in the hallway. Um, maybe it's inviting somebody to church for, for the first time. Maybe love will motivate you to send an encouraging message to somebody and say, hey, you looked a little down the other day. I know X, Y, Z are going, is going on in your life. Just want you to know I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. Hope you're doing okay. Maybe it's just an encouraging note, right? Maybe it's something else. Maybe you're caught up thinking about what's stopping you from loving others, and maybe love will motivate you to have the courage to just apologize and ask for forgiveness. Say, hey, I'm not perfect, but I'm hoping that God redeems me of that and helps me to transform the way I live. But I'm sorry I treated you that way. And that will speak volumes to somebody. You don't have to have it all together. Maybe love will motivate you uh, to, to, you know, uh, be the person that you wish other people had been towards you. Maybe you feel like you struggle with friends. Maybe it'll motivate you to be a friend to someone who needs one, right? What is love motivating you to do? What risks is it motivating you to take, right? Because sharing the good news sometimes requires risk.